Undertale is one of the most critically acclaimed games of the past 10 years, and as such it has been discussed to oblivion and back. But often when the game is discussed, the points of discussion are usually the story, or the music, or the fandom. There is, however, one element of Undertale that I feel is often under-discussed, which is the gameplay. Now, that's not to say that it's never talked about, but I feel that it's really rare to see it being discussed to the degree that I feel it deserves to be. So, let's do it. Let's talk about the gameplay of Undertale. Now, in order to really understand why Undertale plays the way it does, we first have to assess what Undertale was trying to do in the first place. In other words, figure out its elevator pitch. Thankfully, that's very easy to do on account that Toby plastered it all over the marketing. Undertale is the friendly RPG where no one has to die. So that is the design ethos of Undertale, and every aspect of the game is designed to facilitate this idea. To have an RPG, specifically a JRPG, that can be completed without fighting enemies. Now, it is of course worth acknowledging that this is not an idea that has never been done before in other genres. Lots of stealth games let you do this, and a fair amount of CRPGs like Fallout 2 let you do a pacifist playthrough. But these games are not JRPGs. And unlike those other genres, JRPGs are not really well suited for a pacifist playstyle. If you were to break down JRPG combat to its most simplest form, it is a system to stat check the player. Can you deal enough damage to the enemy to beat them before they deal enough damage to you that you game over and lose? Obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but this is the foundation that the genre's combat is built on. The core gameplay loop is to beat enemies in order to raise your stats so you can fight enemies with higher stats. But Undertale wants you to be able to beat the game without raising your stats at all. And how does it manage to do this? Well, it's actually really simple. They just replaced the stat check with a skill check. Instead of the enemies just hitting you, the player has to play a bullet hell minigame in order to determine if the enemies hit you. This is one of the two key elements that allows the game to be beaten without raising your stats. Because when taking damage becomes a thing that only happens when the player makes a mistake, then having more HP is just a luxury that a skilled player doesn't need. As the only thing your HP stat determines is how many mistakes you're allowed to make. Of course, not attacking enemies is still only one of two choices the player can make every time they get into an encounter. The choice to attack is always an option. One that is usually the simpler and more beneficial one, as doing so will raise your HP, making the game easier. In effect, playing a pacifist playstyle is like playing the game on hard mode. And as the player is expected to level up at least a little bit on their first playthrough, when the game asks you to try and play through it again as a pacifist, it is actively propositioning a challenge to the player to beat the game without the extra health that they get for choosing violence. This flows into how the difficulty curve of the game works, with the first playthrough being easier because you will have more HP from leveling up. Once you get to the second playthrough, things will be more difficult as you won't be leveling up at all. But you will be both more skilled and more knowledgeable from having played through the game once already. So you will have a better understanding of the gameplay and know what the enemy's attacks will be. Now, I haven't talked about the second half of Undertale's combat system that allows for you to play through the game in a passive's playstyle, that of course being the act and spare systems. Now thankfully this is very simple to explain. Every enemy has multiple acts you can perform for them, which you choose from the act menu. By performing the correct actions, the enemy will become spareable. You can then spare the enemy to complete the battle. Ending the battle like this will still reward the player with money, but no EXP. This system turns the combat into a puzzle, in which you must assess the monsters and figure out which actions they want you to perform in order to spare them. And it's this, the Act and Spare system, working in tandem with the Bullet Hell minigames, and the more standard attacking that makes up the core combat system. It's only with all of these things working in tandem that Undertale is able to achieve its design ethos. However, it's not their mere existence that made Undertale a beloved masterpiece. Like all things, it's only in the execution that the combat system shows its true power. I think the truth of the matter is that Undertale is like a house of cards. It's impressive and beautiful, but if a single thing was out of place, then the whole thing would fall over. 
In a lot of ways, you can say that the game is perfect and also just barely good. And there are a lot of interconnected moving parts here, so let's just try and take it one at a time. Let's start with the Bullet Hell minigames. The thing about them is that you could replace them with any type of minigame. Anything that tests the player's skills would work. But even though you could swap it out for something else, I'm not sure you could come up with anything better. The best alternative I can think of is a rhythm game minigame. But even that I don't think would be better than what we currently have. And I feel this way because of all the unique upsides that the bullet hell offers. With each monster having multiple unique bullet patterns, it allows for the battles to have a great sense of variety and uniqueness to each encounter. And they can show off the monster's unique personality, which may give you a better insight on them and might help you figure out which axe to use on them. The boss fights take this uniqueness and cranks it up to 11, as most of them fundamentally change the rules of how you interact with the bullets. Like adding gravity or locking your movement to three parallel lines. The bullet patterns do of course get more complex as the game goes on, allowing for a steady difficulty curve. And the fact that you are physically dodging the attacks the monsters are throwing at you makes the whole combat system feel more diegetic. These are things that would be much harder to achieve with a different system. And as for how the act system is executed, well, I think it's done really well. It of course starts off simple, where most enemies only want you to do one correct action in order to spare them, and for some monsters you don't need to do anything in order to spare them. This of course is great, as you will still be figuring out how the game is played. But it doesn't stay like this for long. There is a noticeable difficulty bump as you enter the second area, monsters now requiring multiple of the same acts or doing different acts in the right order in order to spare them. The acts themselves often have additional effects as well, like some that will make monsters attacks weaker or stronger. Sometimes an act won't get you closer to sparing a monster, but it will make the fight easier. But you won't really know that until you experiment with it. Some monsters also have multiple different spare conditions, some of which can only be achieved when said monster is paired with a different monster. And even the attacking, as simple as it is, is still very well executed. The fact that the damage calculation is based on a micro game helps it stay consistent with the rest of the combat system. It's also designed in a way to ensure that the player will never attack a monster accidentally, as you have to hit enter three times in order to declare an attack. And even if you accidentally hit enter two times, all you have to do to not complete the attack is let the bar go through, which will result in a miss. Additionally, if you lower a monster's HP past a certain point, you can spare them. If you choose to play the game in this violent pacifist style, then the game kind of becomes Pokemon. You know, if you could only throw Pokeballs when the Pokemon was at low HP and also all Pokeballs had a 100% catch rate. Now, the only thing I haven't talked about at all yet is the item and healing systems, which are the same thing. because. Basically, all the items are healing items. I think the only one that isn't a healing item, not counting the equipment, is the punch card. What it's supposed to do is make your tough glove do more damage. So, you know, all of the usable items in the game are healing items. And as for the healing system, even this, of course, is flawlessly executed. Reason being is that you are limited to the number of healing items you can have and use. Having a hard limit of 8 is very important, as if the player was able to stock up on infinite healing, then the game would break fairly quickly. How healing works in Undertale is that you use a turn, plus an item, to heal. Healing doesn't progress the fight in most battles, so if you take a turn to heal but end up taking more damage than you healed, then all you did was just delay losing. You didn't actually recover or take any ground. But if you had a massive stockpile of healing items to use, then you could just keep using them until you managed to not take damage. As even at the lowest level, you're extremely unlikely to die at max HP from one attack. You would have to try to get hit from every bullet, meaning that basically, you should never be getting one shot. Having the number of heals you can use be limited makes it so you can't just heal forever. You have to dodge the attacks. 
you can't abuse the healing. It is only with all of these things coming together that Undertale's gameplay is able to achieve what it wants to do, and make something that is fun and engaging as it is. If any little detail was out of place, the whole thing could fall apart. If the monsters didn't have multiple unique bullet patterns, then the Bullet Hell minigames would get boring. If the monsters didn't have unique acts that related to their designs and personality, then the act system wouldn't be engaging. If the healing system wasn't designed to limit the amount of healing you have, then it could easily break the game. If any one of these things were bad, then the game just wouldn't be fun. It's only because every aspect of the combat system is constructed in a flawless manner that the game was able to achieve the accolades it has earned. And the end result of this is a system that is wholly unique, that manages to have broad appeal as it manages to get the best of both worlds in a sense. As you get to enjoy the turn-based decision making that makes JRPGs fun, and the skill checks make the game fun for those who don't enjoy the stat checks of regular turn-based combat. If you're a fan of both styles, then you'll probably love it. If you only like one, then you'll probably at least still like it. But as great as Undertale's gameplay is, it of course could still be better. Deltarune is the successor to Undertale, and it is not finished yet. So, I can't give a full analysis of the game's combat. I can, however, talk about what is here. So let's get this out of the way. Deltarune's combat is Undertale's combat, but more. Almost everything I said about Undertale also applies to Deltarune. So let's just go over the new stuff. So, the biggest difference between the two is that in Deltarune, you have a party of three, as opposed to Undertale, where you have a party of one. And this is something I haven't talked about yet, but the fact that Undertale only has one party member is very unusual. Most JRPGs usually have three to four party members. Sometimes you'll see a party of two for games made for younger audiences, but you almost never see one party member done. Undertale of course gets by with its unique combat system, but of course there is nothing to lose by having more party members. Having more party members inherently adds more complexity to the combat, just from the fact that you now get to perform multiple actions in a single turn. You now have to decide what each party member will do, with each one having unique abilities. On top of this, there are now duo and triple acts, similar to Chrono Trigger, that consume both or all of the party members' turns, making you have to choose between doing one very effective act or multiple different actions. The acts themselves have also gotten an upgrade as well. Many acts now require you to perform a micro game in order for them to work, adding an additional skill check to combat. Additionally, enemies now have a mercy meter, which tells you just how effective your acts are. These new additions add a great deal of skill and knowledge expression. Some enemies, when done in the most efficient way, can be spared in a single turn. Of course, with the amount of options to perform in combat, the player will only be able to find the best option for each encounter after experimenting. And remember, the acts are different for each enemy, which means that the player will have to experiment for every new encounter. And I want to clarify that, yes, these things are in fact good. Being able to end battles in 2-3 to three turns on average is a good thing, especially with a combat system that is incorporating minigames into turn-based combat. You don't want normal encounters to last 6 plus turns. The only reason the player should take 6 plus turns to beat a normal encounter is if they are playing very inefficiently. Long battles should be reserved for boss fights. And each new encounter brings new acts to use that makes it impossible for the combat to get stale and boring. As opposed to standard JRPG fare where your abilities are the same in every battle. In Undertale and Deltarune, you have to learn what each new act does in every battle. Now let's look at a completely new mechanic to Deltarune, TP. Now, you see this bar on the side, that's the TP bar. Basically, you fill it up by doing things and then spend it to perform magic. Some acts also require TP to use them. There are two main ways to fill up the bar, one by defending, which is fairly self-explanatory, said party member does nothing, however, you will take less damage and get TP. The other way to gain TP is to graze. 
So, grazing is a mechanic taken straight from the bullet hell genre. How it works is if you get close to a bullet where it almost hits you, but it doesn't, then you will graze it. And get extra points. In Deltarune, it works the exact same way, except you get TP instead of bonus points. And the TP system and how it's implemented and used is exceptionally good. The grazing mechanic adds a whole new risk-reward layer to the bullet hell minigames, as many times effective grazing is the difference between winning and losing a difficult encounter. Defending is something that just needed to be added anyway, because sometimes you just want to do nothing with a specific character. So having it attached to building up TP lets it feel a lot better, and gives it a greater purpose. Now, TP starts at zero for every battle, so you have to build it up first before you can use it. As of right now, the main uses for it are Rousey's Heal, and Pacify Spell. The Pacify Spell lets you spare enemies that are tired. Basically, some acts will make an enemy tired instead of sparable, and you need to use Pacify on them instead of the normal spare. Susie also has her Rude Buster spell, which deals damage, and as mentioned earlier, some acts cost TP to use. Now, the spell that is the most overall useful is the Heal spell, which lets you spend TP to heal a single ally. Now, you may think that TP is not that important if you don't need to heal yourself or pacify an enemy. However, actual TP is converted to money at the end of an encounter. So you're always encouraged to try and get as much TP as possible, as getting TP is always beneficial, even if you don't spend it in battle. Healing, however, does work a lot differently than it does in Undertale, and not just because you have a healing spell. Just the fact that your health is split in thirds from having three party members basically changes how the healing works and how the player has to interact with it. Since a single teammate going down massively weakens you, you want to make sure they all are at a safe HP range, meaning you are going to be healing more often. And this fact alone allows for the infinite use healing magic to not break the game, especially when you factor in that in order to use the heal, you have to sacrifice an action beforehand by defending, or engage with the graze mechanic. And having party members go down is a great way to have soft punishments for mistakes. When a party member is down, you will be put on the back foot, as you have to use at least one action to heal them, while you are also down an action, as down party members of course cannot act. And Rousey is the only party member that can heal with magic, so if he goes down, you will have to use an item to get him back up right away. There is, however, the mechanic that downed allies will regain health when down. So even if you use up all your items, you can always make a comeback as long as you play well. Now finally, let's go over attacking. It's mostly the same. The time bar thing is back, although I do think it's overall better just from being cleaner. I also like that the indicator for landing a crit is both at the end now and is just much easier to understand. Honestly, if you are playing the game offensively, then the gameplay isn't too different from the average JRPG. The only real big decision making you do is decide if you want to use your TP on a magic attack or save it for a heal. However, this is something that only really comes into play during boss fights, as normal encounters you can just beat them by spamming attack, as saving TP to use a rude buster is only really worth it when fighting enemies that both have a lot of health and can deal a lot of damage to you easily. Otherwise, it's just faster to use regular attacks most of the time. Now, as Deltoon is still far from finished, I can't really give a full analysis of it, and as such I can't come to a full conclusion. What I can say is that in my opinion, it has already surpassed Undertale in terms of gameplay. And that is the gameplay of Undertale and Deltarune. I hope you liked the video. If you did, why not leave a like and subscribe? If this video gets over 2,000 likes, that seems like a high but still achievable number. Yeah, if it gets 2,000 likes, then I will make a video talking about the other half of Undertale's gameplay. You know, walking around, talking to people, solving puzzles, you know, and stuff. Maybe even cover the level design. Yeah. Not a joke, by the way. I will make that video. Anyway, if you like Deltrune, I have Deltrune 3 videos you can watch. If you like game design analysis, I have a few videos on that as well, with more videos of both kind on the way, so make sure to subscribe for more content in the future.